Joshua judges Ruth. And then after Ruth is 1 Samuel. Joshua judges Ruth and then 1 Samuel. In beginning this book, the story of Naomi and Ruth, we note that in chapter 1 there's the crisis for the royal line. And then the chapter is divided into three or perhaps four different sections. And we began looking last week at the setting for the crisis. The text says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed. When the judges governed. And so the book of Ruth opens up with an unexpected absence. There's no king here. There's a, this is a time when the judges governed. And we noted that the, the word judges there. It's really a word in our English that would be better translated as chieftains. These were chieftains. They were local people. They were not over all of Israel at all. Never were. You can go look at um, Bible dictionary and perhaps maybe some maps in the back of your Bible will have this. Othniel will, uh, he judged in a certain section of Israel and then Samson judged in another section. Sometimes these judges overlapped but they were all in different sections. They were chieftains over a small tribe, a small group of people. And they were morally, they never, they were never morally capable of bringing revival except within their own little realm here. They would deliver physically from the, from the oppression from the Philistines or from the Moabites or the Ammonites or whoever it is that's oppressing them, they would, God would use them to grant deliverance to the people from the oppressors, but they were never moral enough to take the next step and bring about a spiritual revival in the land. They just, delivered, they, they were the instruments that God used to deliver the people and then they had a measure of peace, 20, maybe 40 years of peace, and then the whole cycle started again. That cycle continued about 309 years. It would begin, there would be oppression, people would complain to the Lord, God would raise up a judge, he would deliver, there would be a period of freedom, and the whole thing would start over and over again. And the theme of the whole book of Judges is everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So this is going on, this went on for about 309 years. It began with the death of Joshua and it ended with the coronation of Saul. In between there. The, the character of these judges are, are not to be emulated mostly. And you, you know the character of Samson. You know, if you study the character of Jephthah, the, the character of Ehud, these men are not to be emulated in their character. God, they were simply instruments that God used to bring about the freedom for a, a small period of time. So it was in this, in this time, somewhere in this 309-year period, probably towards the end, probably towards the end, because the, gen, the genealogy in chapter 4 puts... David at two generations after Boaz and Ruth. So if there are no gaps, if there are no gaps in the genealogy, then these events that we read about in Ruth happen about two, maybe three generations before David comes on the scene. If that is true. There was, at this time, famine in the land. It says, all the events in the book are precipitated by a famine that struck the land of Israel. And we know that famines cause many deaths and the scarcity of food would drive the parents to desperate measures for their children. We've never had a famine in this land. I think maybe perhaps the Dust Bowl of the 1930s maybe in Oklahoma, the Midwest, that may qualify in some measure to be a famine of small proportions. But we've never had a famine here. Uh, when you have a famine, uh, people die. A lot of people die because there's no food. There's no way to grow the food or the ground is not su suitable to grow the food. So this famine drove Imelech and his family to Moab. Evidently, it was local, more local than anything else, but it drove them to, to Moab. And we should be very, we should be hesitant and very careful about throwing rocks at Imelech and Naomi, he went there because his family was starving. 
So he went where there was food. Evidently, it was a time where the relations between Moab and Israel were somewhat amiable so they could go there and perhaps not be, uh, not risk being killed because they were feuding or they were warring against one another. So the relations must have been at least acceptable enough, calm enough for them to go over there and to, and to live. And it was not a small move because the land promised to Israel was blessed by God. It was the land where the blessings were to be found. So it had to be really bad for an Israelite in the Old Testament to leave the promised land. He would have to do that when conditions, he would have done that when conditions were just dire. And so to feed his family, they did this. And in addition to all that, this is, we covered this a little bit last week, in addition to all that, to live among the people who, were tr- who had treated Israel with such aggression recently and historically would not be a shallow decision. It was a desperate move, and so they did this. And it's the first of a series of adversities that completely alter Naomi's life and that ultimately will lead her into a crisis of faith. Now, biblical famines, you note that there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Biblical famines have many causes. Drought will cause a famine, uh, disease, locusts, invasions, loss of livestock. All of these are examples, cases in Scripture, in 1 Kings, in Amos 4, In Genesis 41, all of these are listed here. Warfare causes famine in 2 Kings chapter 7. Well, the cause of the famine here is not indicated. We're we're curious, or we ought to be curious, why was there a famine in the land? Is it because of Israel's disobedience? Now, we know that God had promised Israel, if you disobey me, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to send famine I'm going to do all these kinds of things, uh, send the plagues on you that, were, that I sent on Egypt. One time the Lord says that. But the text here is, it doesn't tell us why the famine came. In fact, throughout the book of Judges, the text doesn't say that any of the famine came because of Israel's disobedience. We would be on fairly good ground to presume that because God had already promised that he would do that. But the text doesn't say that he did this. Now, you might remember Abram and Sarai in Genesis 12, Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis 26, and Jacob and his sons also took a journey at times in famine in Genesis 41 through 47. So famine in these ancestors, in these uh, Israel's fathers... In these stories of their life, it functions simply to set in motion the events of life or the events of interest. In other words, they would travel to one place and it's not necessarily to to communicate anything theologically. It was just that they, they did this and the scripture told us to do this because there was some other reason. And we all, we know that when Abram and Sarah and Jacob and who else was it? Isaac, when they all went to Egypt, or excuse me, when they all traveled because of famine, they all came back richer. They came back more, more wealthy, wealthier because of these travels. Now, from a theological perspective, the famine may be explained as a judgment act of God. We noted that. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 specifically predicted God would cut off the rain and send famine if Israel went after other gods and persisted in rebellion against him. But as we noted earlier, the book of Judges never mentions famine as being a divine judgment during the period of the Judges, which is interesting. It kind of leaves us in a point where do we read it into it because God's already said he would do it, or do we back away from it because the text doesn't say it was because of a famine. The fact that the family crossed the Jordan east to Moab suggests that the famine was localized and and may indicate that the famine was, was God's judgment because it was localized. Um, the famine would serve two purposes here. First of all, the biblical pattern of famines 
despite their tragic appearances, often advance God's plan for his people. As we, as we mentioned a moment ago, you remember when Abram, Abraham went to Egypt, Isaac went to Philistia, and Jacob went to Egypt. All three of them experienced divine protection, and they came out wealthier than before. So famines often are God's means of taking his people in certain direction, and they come back later with more camels and more donkeys and more goats and more sheep. Second of all, there is a link between this story and the patriarchs, where you read in Ruth 1.1, now there was a famine in the land. You read the very same thing in Genesis 12.10, now there was a famine in the land. The very same thing in Genesis 26 and verse 1. And so we, the readers, should watch for this in Ruth when we see it. Will the results of this famine, again driving an Israelite family out of the country, will it result in some sort of gain? If we're familiar with the text, we recognize now there was a famine in the land. Hmm, I wonder if God is going to bless Naomi in some way, just like he blessed Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when they went away to different parts because of famine as well. So the family went to Moab to live as a resident alien. They went to sojourn there. They, they, it appears, though, the word doesn't mean that they had intention of permanently staying there, but staying there long enough uh, to stay alive until the Lord began to bless where they came from and began to send rain where they can grow crops. So it's a resident alien. The grammar of the phrase suggests the initiative was Elimelech's and the participation of Naomi and his two boys are a secondary issue. So this is Elimelech doing what he thinks he needs to do for his family because there's no food. You can't stay where there's no food. So Elimelech chose Moab rather than Egypt. Did you ever think about that? Abram goes to Egypt. Several people go to Egypt in the past. Why do they go to Moab? Why Moab? Well, the possibilities can only be suggested. First of all, simple distance. If you look back at a map on, in your Bible, you'll see that Moab is right next. It's on the western side of the Dead Sea. So it's very close compared to Egypt. So distance perhaps was... Uh, a factor. Egypt, of course, is much further than Moab. Second of all, the fertile plain of Moab may have been an important breadbasket for Palestine and it would have attracted famine refugees. They've done, archaeology has done some excavations at the ancient capital of Moab called Dibon, D I B O N, and they found evidence of highly organized agricultural production. So, evidently, the fertile ground there. The plains that are there were good for growing crops, and so it would attract people who are living in famine conditions. Third, the common ancestry shared by Israel and Moab may have facilitated such contacts. And we'll speak about that in, in just a moment, Moab's origins. Realistically, however, the family left the familiar for the unfamiliar and the known for the unknown. Legally, the family is strangers and they do face a potentially precarious life of social ostracism. Very, very possible for, for being there. They would, be at the peace, they would be at the mercy of the people of Moab. So those, those things being true, the famine must have been bad. It, must, it, it cannot have been the top of the list you, you go through, well, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And last resort, we move to Moab. Well, the Lord worked it out so that they had to move to Moab. Now, theologically, we can think about this and we can say, well, I know why. Because God had determined that a girl by the name of Ruth, before the foundation of the world, would be the great-grandmother of the greatest king in Israel's history, David. We know that because we know the rest of the story as Paul Harvey used to say, thank you. But they don't know this at this point. Elimelech is just going because there's nothing, he's at the ropes, he's at his ropes end. He has to do something or the family's going to suffer. 
So the move here, we can ask, was the move an act of faith or unbelief? Should they have stuck around in, in uh, Epaphrathah, in Bethlehem area? Should they have stayed there? They know this is the land of blessing. Should they have just waited this out and trust God will provide for them? Well, the author does not tell us how to interpret that. The author does not disparage the choice to temporarily leave the famine-stricken town. And we have parallels in Abraham's life, Genesis 12, Genesis 20. But these parallels in Abraham's life do not suggest that Imelech's move was in unbelief. You remember when Abraham left and he lied about his wife, right? Tell him you're my, my brother, my sister, okay? He did that to save his own hide. That was, he didn't get in trouble because he went to Egypt. He got in trouble because he lied. So the move necessarily um, is not commented on by the author here, and it wasn't there. And they came out, again, they came out much more wealthy. But we, the reader, we're tempted to interpret the deaths of Imelech, of Kilion, and Malon in the land of Moab as consequences of the spiritual condition in the land. That's, that's what we would tend to do. In light of Ruth 1.13, verse 13 says, would you therefore wait until they were grown? That says, you're going to wait for me. The two girls are saying, you're going to wait for me to have, get married again and have boys and hang around for another 16 years and then marry them. That's what she's saying. Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. So in light of that passage, it seems Imelech designed his own solution instead of remaining in the land of promise. Naomi is, is bitter. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter. And as we noted before, the word sojourn suggests Imelech intended to wait out the famine in Moab and then return when it was over. So several things need to be kept in mind in a decision as to whether the move was right or not. First of all, you remember Moab's detestable origin. You remember Lot and his wife? The angels went there. They said to Lot and his wife and his daughters, you need to get out. God's going to destroy this place. They got out. They went out. Don't look back. Lot's wife looked back, right? She turned into a pillar of salt. That leaves Lot and his two daughters, and they think it's all, they think there's nobody around. That's their thought. There's, there's nobody else. How are we going to to procreate so what they do what the two daughters do is they get their dad drunk and they go in and they lay with him and the next night they get him drunk again and the other one goes in and lays with him and the result is Moab and Ammon the Ammonites and the Moabites are related to Israel and that's why God says later to Israel don't attack Israel, don't attack Moab. I've given the land of Moab, of this land to Moab, leave them alone. They are related to Israel. And in the, I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel, God through Ezekiel says to Moab and to Ammon, to Edom as well, because he descended, that was descended from Esau. Why did you treat your brother Israel the way you treated him? So there is a relationship there. And that may be why they went to Moab. First, there was probably food there, and the distance is probably a huge factor as well. And there is, there is a relation there. But their detestable origins are from, in other words, they are from incest. The Moabite people are from an incestuous relationship. The Ammonite people are from an incestuous relationship as well. That's Genesis 19, verses 30 through 38. Second of all, the Moabites' refusal to allow Israel to pass through their territory when they come from Egypt in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. And third, the Moabite women seduction, women's seduction of Israel and the following punishment in chapter 25. And a, a last thing, um, a fourth thing to consider 
is Israel's constitutional exclusion of Moab from the assembly of the Lord. When, they were, when Israel was traveling through, the Moabites refused to allow Israel to pass through their land. Another thing is the Moabite women seduce the, the men of Israel and then there's punishment following that. Remember Balaam, Balak? They're Moabite people. They, Balaam, Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. And of course, God said, no, you're only gonna say what I give you words to say. So as a result of what Moab did to Israel, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses three through six, it is stated that no Moabite would enter into the house of the Lord. So this doesn't look good. Why would you go to Moab? She has detestable origins. They refuse to allow you to pass through in the past. The Moabite women seduce the men to try to, try to um, mix, try to uh, mix their religion so that they would not be the people of God and they would not be effective. And then the, the constitutional exclusion from Moab. And last, recent aggression on the Israelites by Eglon, king of Moab in Judges chapter 3. So all of those things, you consider all of those things, you wonder why did he go to Moab? But again, the text doesn't disparage, doesn't criticize his, uh, the Imelec and his family going there. There must have been uh, peace among Moabites and Israelites at this time, relative peace anyway, for them to go there. So the text doesn't say, you're, you're pretty much, if you want to take the position, I think it was probably wrong for them to go there, you can have several reasons to, to justify. If you say, well, the text doesn't say it was wrong, and Abram did this, and Jacob did this, and it was not criticized, and you could use those for justification. But there's, of course, there's more. There's the death of Elimelech and the two boys, which... Throws, in, throws us into another tizzy. What happened? Did they die because they weren't supposed to be there? We're getting, we're going to get to that. But first of all, um, do you have those up there, Gene? Okay, can y'all see that? This is, those hills, this is on a hill looking at Bethlehem and... Is there a pointer? There's no pointer. Okay. Uh, the hills just beyond Bethlehem, after those hills, it drops into the Dead Sea. And all of those hills that you see in the background there, that's Moab. Just to give you a view. Uh, if you were to turn this sideways, you would see... Bethlehem, some hills, and it drops down the Dead Sea, and it goes back up. There you see it. There you have a better view of that one right there. There on the left. The picture on the right are the two possible paths of Elimelech and his family getting there. They either went north around the top to the area of Moabite, or they went south down around the Dead Sea where the land is fairly close and it was fairly shallow and they can cross there. So you can see the picture on the left, how the, the, the uh, topography, how the, the land of Moab rises up and then you have plains at the top and it made for good growing. It was about 18 inches average rainfall there, which is pretty good. It's enough to grow good stuff. The next one, is there one more, I think? No, just those two? Okay. So that gives you an idea. Perhaps that's what, um, perhaps that's what Elimelech saw and the people knew as there's famine in their land, they could look across, you could see probably 20, 25, 30 miles, and you could see rain, rain storms coming up over the hills, over Moab. They knew there was crops growing there. The rumors would get out. There's food there, and he left. And who knows? 
you know, God has given us the story of Naomi and his Elimelech and his family. There could have been numerous families that left Bethlehem and did the same thing. That's, that's possible. Thank you very much. Elimelech, you know, Old Testament names mean something. Elimelech's name means my, co- my God is king or God is king. Uh, Ezekiel, for example, means God is strong. But Elimelech means my God is king or God is king. And it occurs only here. It's the only time that it occurs in the whole Old Testament is right here. Naomi, that name means to be pleasant. And like the name Elimelech, it occurs only here in this book in the Old Testament. The name of the boys are uncertain. It, it's really tough to discern what the, name, what the boys' names mean. Malon, M-A-H-L-O-N, it may be from a, a root not found in Hebrew except in proper names. And in this, in this case, the sense would be unknown. More likely, it's derived from H-A-L-A, hala, which means to be sick. Now, maybe in the providence of God, they named him that. Maybe they were tiny when they were born, and they named him some form from the root hala, which means to be sick. Kilion is constructed from the root, root kala, K-A-L-A. And that word means to be finished or come to an end, hence frailty or mortality. We don't know, I don't, we don't know how, how many years are different between the boys, whether they're 18 months different or two years difference, but neither one of the boys, evidently neither one of the boys were strong and healthy young boys. They, they had a measure, or, uh, at least an appearance of frailty about them, or just in the providence of God, he moved Elimelech to name his two boys these names. Of course, they are, because we know the story, the names are ominous, pointing to the intensification of a crisis that's about to strike Naomi. The entire family is ethnically identified as Ephrathites, belonging to the tribe of Judah. Of course, that has to be, right? Because the scepter will not depart from Judah. Remember that? Uh, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, there's that promise to Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah. So if David is going to come, if David is the great grandson of uh, Boaz and Ruth, then you know that Naomi and Elimelech are from the tribe of Judah. And Boaz is going to be from the tribe of Judah as well. So they, they're, they're Ephrathites. And Ephrathah seems to have been a region or a sub-area or district around Bethlehem. You might remember in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, Ephrathah is mentioned along with Bethlehem. Uh, sometimes you see in Micah 5 too, you do see Ephrathah and Bethlehem mentioned together. Apparently the two areas overlapped somewhat. Um, Ephrathah was either a part of the town or it was a larger district within the town our smaller district within this within the town. Now, where does where does the clan name come from? How do you get a name Ephrathah? Where does that come from? Well, guess what? The clan name may have been derived from Ephrath, E P H R A T H, the wife of Caleb. Remember Caleb, Caleb and Joshua, the two spies that came back with a good report. Caleb's wife was Ephrath. E-P-H-R-A-T-H, whose descendants, their descendants, settled Bethlehem and Ephrathah, and that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 19 and verses 50 and 51. The two towns of Ephrathah and Bethlehem are not the same, but they're certainly in the same region or the district, and sometimes they're mentioned together. So all of that hopefully gives us a really good background and understanding of what's going on in the time of the judges when they governed 
there was a famine in the land, a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to stay temporarily in the land of Moab because he must have heard that there was food there and he took his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. And verses 3 through 5 brings up the nature of the crisis. This, we have all our introductions now. We have the scene set, what's going on. Now we have the nature of the crisis, the problem stated in verses 3 through 5. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Getting right to the point, the author is, our, our, our author here offers no account of time, place, circumstance, or cause of death. We don't know, were they there six months and then he died? Were they there 10 years and then he died? Were they there 20 years and he died? We don't even know what caused the death. And there's nothing suggests here that suggests here divine punishment from God. It's not the point. Uh, obviously, the, if the writer wanted us, if God wanted us to know what was going on uh, uh, regarding Elimelech, and if it had something to do with the main story here, the main thrust of this story, he would have told us. But we don't know. It's not necessary that we know. We know that he died. The verb there was left. You see that in verse 3. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. That word there, was left, adds poignancy to the statement. To be left over, it means to remain, which often describes the bereavement at the death of another. And adding to her bereavement is the fact that to be buried in a foreign land was considered the ultimate punishment, according to Amos chapter 7 and verse 17. You can be buried in some place that's not blessed by God. Why would you do that? The shift in parental responsibility is indicated by the two phrases. In verses 1 and 2, you have his two sons. But in verse 3, you have her two sons. So in verse 2, the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. But now in verse 3, Elimelech died and she was left with her two sons. That's showing us a transfer in parental responsibility by those phrases. The departed Elimelech once called his wife. In verse 2 is now her husband in verse 3. In the Old Testament, that's a highly unusual way to relate a man to his wife. It is Naomi now who occupies center stage as others are identified in relation to her. Now it's her husband died, her two sons, her daughter-in-laws. So Naomi's taking center stage as others are identified in relation to her. Even when she finds out what field did you glean in? He is one of our kinsmen. So everything kind of relates around to Naomi. And remember last week we talked about there were several reasons why Ruth is in, the, in this book. And you, can, you can go back and listen to the tape. There were, you can't narrow this down, I don't believe, to one reason why. There are several reasons why that uh, we have the book of Ruth in our canon. Well, this happened in verse 3. She was left with her two sons. Again, we don't know how long they were in the land when this happened. We don't know how old the boys were when they moved. We don't know how old the boys were when they moved. Marrying age, we know this. Marrying age at this time in Israel, the boys married a little bit later than the girls. Boys were married by 18, 
17, 18, they were married. Girls were married by 12, 13, 14, uh, for sure. So the boys were not married they, when they were in Israel, so they left. So they're younger than 16, 15, in that area. Well, it says in verse 4, they, her two sons, they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. So they lived X amount of time there in Moab. The boys were older. They must have known their neighbors well. The mom and dad from the Moabite family must have given their blessing, said, okay, you can marry an Israelite boy. So I suspect that relations between Moab and Israel were favorable at the time. Because they did marry Moabite women. Well, Orpah and Ruth do not occur anywhere else in the Old Testament. Orpah is the most difficult to discern a meaning. What does her name mean? The name is often associated with neck, N-E-C-K, neck. And some understand it to mean something like obstinacy or stiff-necked one. This assumes the author invented the name to underscore how Orpah turned back on Naomi and returned to Moab. Some commentators would say that. But the text offers no sure evidence other than her name and its possible, uh, and its possible meaning such an attitude was part of, um, such an attitude was part of Orpah. In other words, that's what some people would say, obstinacy, obstinacy, but we really don't know. Ruth is the most obscure name in the book. Most likely it means to soak, irritate, refresh. Hence, refreshment, uh, satiation, comfort is what Ruth means. Root, really, is how you would say it, R-U-T. The H would not be there. There would be a breath maybe a little bit. At the moment, it is not clear which of the sons married which girls. In chapter 4 and verse 10, we learn that Ruth married Malon. Now, if usually the way these are, the way boys are listed, they're list, listed according to age, usually. So it says in verse 2, his wife Naomi and the name of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. So we would presume, unless we have good reason to not believe this, that Malon was older than Kilion. By how much, we don't know, but usually the older is listed, listed first. Now we have another little discussion. How was the marriage to Moabite women to be evaluated? Was this good or bad? Should they have done this? Is this the reason why they died? Because they married Moabite women? What does the text say? Surprise, nothing about this. Like the cause of the famine and the family's move to Moab, the author does not say. It's a natural, it is natural that Israelites who lived outside the land to marry local women. It's not unheard of that Israelites living in a different land, they would marry local women. That's, that's, that's not unheard of. Joseph marries Asenath in Egypt and Moses marries Zipporah, the Midianite. So far as we know, neither one of them was was uh, chided by God because of that. We know that neither one of these men, however, returned to the land of Canaan with his foreign wife. Whether that's an indication that it was wrong or not, again, the text doesn't say. In the case of the marriages, is the author's silence on details a signal of approval, disapproval, or indifference? What does it mean when the text doesn't say? Some say the sons married after Elimelech's death because their dad, Elimelech, opposed marriage to foreign women. But we have no way of knowing that. None. 
some old Jewish commentators, and we're, we're talking about mid to late 1800s, some Jewish commentators that Jews today still hold in high esteem, some of those see the verse as a silent protest against intermarriage. Some comment of related passages will offer some guidance. So here's some comment on related passages that help us think through this. First of all, the law, Mosaic law, neither explicitly forbade nor prohibited a foreigner from becoming an Israelite. And then we know that, right? Rahab became an Israelite. If you read in David's Mighty Men, remember that in first and second Samuel, in the latter chapters of that of that book, David's mighty men are listed. And there's a lot of men that aren't Israelites that are listed there. But they believed in David. They believed in the God of David. And so they, beca- they came and became Israelites. They, that's the way in the Old Testament that you were saved. You became a follower of the God of, of Yahweh and you, you went through these rituals, the, these kinds of things that you had to do. And that's the reason it was such a big deal. When the church was born, Remember, the Judaizers were saying, you have to obey the law. You have to be circumcised in order. That's the way it was for 1,500 years in the Old Testament. And that's why they had to have the meeting in Acts chapter 15 to say, look, the Gentiles have been granted life just as us. They don't have to, they don't have to go through all these rituals in order to be saved, in order to follow the God of Israel. So the law... The law said this, it, it's, it doesn't forbade, it doesn't prohibit a foreigner from becoming an Israelite. So there's nothing wrong with Ruth coming to Israel and following the God of Israel. Nothing at all wrong with that. Second of all, Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 3 forbids marriage with the people to be dis, dispossessed from the land. In other words, God did forbid marriage with the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, but not other foreigners. The Moabites are not listed with these Canaanite nations, and Israel knew they were, Israel, Moses, knew they were people of a foreign god. The Moabites worshipped a foreign god, Kamosh. They knew that, but it was not on the banned list. You can't marry people from this, marry women from this land. Moabite was, or Moab was not there. We know that in Numbers chapter 25, Israel, quote, began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. And as a result of joining themselves to Baal of Peor, the Lord was angry against Israel. We know this. It doesn't seem good And uh, Numbers chapter 24 says, you are ruined, O people of Kamosh. That's in chapter 21 and verse 29. We have these kind of statements about the people of Moab. And these facts considered, one commentator says, since they were the people of Kamosh, a foreign god, the spirit of the law would have included them. In other words, they didn't have to list the people specifically in order for them to be on the ban. You can't marry their women. Well, that's, that really is taking a leap. Since, I mean, how, you can say, you could say that the spirit of the law would have included them. You could say that about a lot of stuff. Where do you stop saying that? Well, they have this similarity and this similarity. Okay, so that means they're, they're within the spirit of the law. But there are five similarities. You only have two. So when do you decide when is the spirit of the law and when it's not? You see, it's up in the air at that point. However, so here's my however. Individuals in a nation or in the nation of Moab may be converted to follow Yahweh. Even if Moab was on this list, don't marry women from Moab, could individuals believe in the God of Israel and follow him? Of course. I believe Rahab was a Canaanite, wasn't she? 
Mm -hmm. Rahab was a Canaanite. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Rahab, uh, Naaman, the leper. There are others. So even if Moab was on the don't marry list, people, individuals who believe in the God of Israel, follow him, can, can participate in Israel and can be a part of Israel. So a condemned nation does not promise every individual within the nation is condemned. So if Ruth, we know what Ruth does because we know the rest of the story, right? Your God will be my God and I will follow you. She made a commitment. That was her devotion. She stuck with it. She, God changed her heart. Where she learned what she learned, we don't know. Whether Naomi taught the girls, whether their husbands taught their wives, or it was everybody participated, we don't know. There is... Um, There's so much more here. <laughs> um, you could, we could bring in ne Nehemiah and Ezra. Remember, they, they told the people to break up their marriages. That's a, whole, that's a completely different context. But I have, I have quite a bit of information here. What we can say um, is that the writer here, the author, says nothing negative about this marriage. Nothing. Ruth was admitted into Israel and treated as an equal. Did Boaz simply overlook the Mosaic law because he loved Ruth? Not likely, because that would be inconsistent with his otherwise meticulous adherence to the law. Did Deuteronomy 23 and verse 3 apply only to male Moabites? Remember, a Moabite shall not enter my, my, my worship center. Did that apply only to male Moabites since the masculine noun is used? Again, not likely because the male gender would have been the normal one to use in describing all Moabites regardless of being men or women. So I come down to this, a couple of points here and then we'll be done. If you want to be done, I've got more information. First of all, setting aside the fact that a marriage took place, the boys had died. Denial to the assembly could not mean exclusion from the community as such, but only from the formal times and places of community worship. It would have been a simple matter to issue a command that such a one be excommunicated from the community, be cut off, if that were the intent here, and it's not. Secondly, Probably Ruth was admitted because she had placed her faith in the God of Israel. This was the essential requirement for entrance into the covenant community as God explained to Abraham when he gave him the rite of circumcision. The Mosaic covenant that was added to Israelites added to Israelite life, excuse me, the Mosaic covenant that was added to Israelite life generations later specified among other things the naturalization requirements for people who wanted to immigrate into Israel from other nations. So the, the, the statement about Moabites in Deuteronomy seems to have pertained to people who were not believers in Yahweh and yet who wanted to become Israelites. No. It's sort of like the same issue that we have now. If you want to come here and sell drugs, no. If you want to come here and be a part of a gang, no. If you want to come here and learn English, and get a job? Yes. Guess what? That's not new. You have it here. There would have been many such cases of this people wanting to come into Israel who were not believers in Yahweh and Israel would not have allowed them to do that. The whole purpose of Israel going in and dispersing the people was so that the people would not influence Israel on the, with the negative side. So according to previously given instructions in Genesis 17, anyone who became a believer in Yahweh could become an Israelite. It was Israel's purpose in the world, after all, to bring the nations into a saving relationship with God. So the original question here, 
that we had, how is the marriage to Moabite women to be evaluated, we have no indication that it was sinful. We have no indication that that was the reason Kilion and Malon died. Not at all. And in fact, you see Ruth wanting to, whether it's through the relationship with her husband, she quote-unquote fell in love with the God of Israel, whether it was that or what was the character of uh, Kilion's, uh, Malon's mother, Naomi, we don't know, but she became a lover of the God of Israel and devoted herself to that. And they lived there, the last thing, verse 4. Oh, yeah, the last thing. And they lived there about 10 years. The length of stay in Moab is, is noted here. It seems that it was longer than 10 years. And here's why I say that. You see the word in verse, the second part of verse 1. Um... And a certain man in Bethlehem and Judah went. From, I'm, tr I'm tracing this now because it seems like it's longer than 10 years. From a man, in verse 1, went. Through, they were there, in the second part of verse 2, to the second part of verse 4, they lived there. The family became more firmly planted in Moab. There's a progression there. They moved into an area and they settled down and got to know people and they established, they raised their boys. The two boys were part of the family when they moved. We see that. And this phrase argues strongly that the sons and Naomi lived in Moab about 10 years rather than they were married for 10 years. Okay? That's, that's important here. The phrase argues strongly that the sons and Naomi lived in Moab about 10 years rather than they were married 10 years. They must have moved to Moab when the boys were in their early teens, perhaps, getting very close to uh, uh, nearing marriage age. Verses 11 and 12 indicate that Naomi is too old for bearing children. Do you see that? She's too old for bearing children. Hmm. So she's 50s? Uh, people didn't live as long as they live today. Um, statements in the New Testament where Paul says, the aged Paul, something like that, we, we, the best we know, we're guessing around early 60s, mid 60s. She's marriage age, she's of the age to marry, but she says, I'm not of the age to have boys. Too old for childbearing, not marriage. And when Ruth does have a baby, other than uh, women encouraging Naomi, excuse me, let me say that again. When Ruth does have a baby, other women encourage Naomi saying, may he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age in chapter 4 and verse 15. So you put the, all this together and the boys were in their early teens getting close to marrying age. They went there and indications are they lived there 10 years. So all this happens within 10 years. It appears as though all this happens within 10 years. And within that 10 years, Naomi is, considers herself to, too old for bearing, bearing children. And by the time you get to the end of the book and Ruth has a baby, it's, it's, it can't have lasted more than, you know, more than a year, 18 months. This whole process couldn't have lasted very long. They regard her as, as a, you know, may this baby be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. So evidently she had these boys when she was older. Maybe she had trouble having children. She had miscarriages perhaps and finally the Lord gave her two and they named both of them sickly. Sickly looking. One of the themes of Ruth is the answer or the problem of an heir. 
When hope seems gone for Naomi, old age, she has a daughter-in-law, Ruth, who is better to her than seven sons. Chapter 4, verse 15. And we'll stop right there and pick it up with both Malon and Kilion also died. After verse 5, this all ends. And so in verse 6, they begin considering, she be, Naomi begins considering going back because there's just nothing here. She's been bereft of her husband, so she, she has no economic means of sustaining herself. And then her two boys die, and so now she's completely in the wind. She figures, I, I've got nothing here. I'm just going to go home. And that's where the Lord providentially takes her. So it's going to get, after verse 5, it's going to start picking up. Uh, no more death. No more babies dying, anything else. Just good things happen. But all of this has to happen first. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Possibly. Maybe they were malnourished because of the famine. famine. But if they, if they were there 10 years, if we're correct in saying that uh, the phrase argues strongly that the sons of Naomi lived in Moab about 10 years rather than they were married 10 years, then the boys were probably born before the famine or it was a famine that lasted several years. That's possible. Good question. See, there's lots of, you, you don't know what you don't know until you start studying and then you go, hmm, why did they do that? Is this wrong? Is that why they died? Why did they die? And you, off you go. Books are spread all over your desk. <laughs> uh, looking at everything you can find that will give you any kind of insight into what's going on. Yes, ma'am. It's less common. It's certainly less common because marriages were arranged in these days. Marriages were arranged. We know that Moses married, a, uh, yeah, Moses married a girl from Midian and Joseph married a girl in Egypt because they lived there for a while. Ruth came in um, because she, she was allowed back in because she was a follower. They, they knew Ruth's character because of her reputation at following, following Naomi. As Boaz says, I've heard of you, how you stuck with your mother-in-law through this. But it was less common because the marriages were arranged. Israelite family is not going to arrange a marriage with an Ammonite. Not usually. Yes, ma'am. That's possible. That's, you see the statement in verse, what is it, verse 4? You have in verse 4 the last sentence. It's a, it's a separate sentence by itself. And they lived there about 10 years, okay? The boys lived there 10 years after they were married. The whole family lived there 10 years. Did they live 10 years after Elimelech died? All of those, you start asking questions about this. And from my study, the phrase argue strongly um, that the sons and Naomi lived in Moab about 10 years rather than they were married for 10 years. That's, that's what my study has shown. So all of this happened. They moved there. Elimelech dies probably four or five years later, six years later. The boys marry. They die. And within 10 years, you have all this happening is what it, the text seems to be saying. It wouldn't change the meaning of anything necessarily if after Elimelech they lived there 10 years. 
if you were to say that, I don't, at this point, I don't see how it would change anything other than uh, just the time frame. I have, uh, the reasons I have are some grammar reasons and, and you'll jump all over me if I give them to you. They're in a footnote. Yes, ma'am. I believe that they would have understood one another. Um, you have, you know, in Numbers 25, when they're marching through there, you have no indication that there were language barriers there. It's some, it would be some form of Semitic, of course. Perhaps a different dialect. You have, Ukrainian and Russian are slightly different. But you have to live there to know. He's speaking Ukrainian. Well, he's speaking Russian but they would both know what each other is saying. It would probably be something like that because they're so closely tied. Anything else? <laughs> okay. Okay. In where it says, and they, they, both times, is masculine referring to the boys. The names of the women are given in a disjunctive clause. The verse is read, so the verse would read like this. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives, and they lived there about ten years. The verse states two separate facts. So it's two separate facts. What you're thinking is they, they took for them wives and they lived there 10 years. What I'm arguing is that this, the verse states two separate facts. That would be the difference. Groups of men and women. Okay. It would be, um, well, Greek is a little bit more, Greek is a little bit different. Anthropos would be all of, Anir would be men. Like this morning in Acts, and there were, the, the total of men, Anir, who were saved were 5,000. That's pretty good indication that they were talking males only. Any other questions? Good. I hope you're enjoying this. I am. Th this is, keeps me up late at night. So we'll pick up with uh, Malon and Kilion also died. And we'll, we note that tragedy strikes in double portion this time when both her boys. Can you imagine both your boys are dying? There's no indication in the text that they died how, you know, one day one died, the next one, we don't know. But evidently they died fairly close together. Maybe it was some disease or sickness that the boys got. Maybe they were physically weak to begin with and they just weren't strong. We don't know. Lord, thank you for your blessings.